Namaskaram. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have a new guest and his name is Siddharth. Siddharth Vishwanathan. And Siddharth is not your, uh, you know, normal everyday uh, 25 year old. I don't know his age, but I think he's around 25 plus, give or take. Uh, and he'll tell us his actual age. But what is interesting about Siddharth is how he studied right from his childhood, how he did it. Now I just want to read out his resume so that you guys have an idea of what he's doing currently. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at Stanford University and currently working in a blockchain startup. He's also pursuing a master's degree in Computer Science at Stanford. A passionate student of Sanskrit poetics, grammar and linguistics, he took a gap year to spend time in Chhattisgarh where he studied Samskrita Vyakaranam in a traditional Gurukulam setting. Some of his Sanskrit related work may be seen on YouTube channel called the Sanskrit Corner, which has popular videos to teach Sanskrit, music and poetry. Siddhartha is also a serious student of Carnatic music and performs concerts in his spare time. A few interesting facts about him. He has not attended regular school till college. Instead, he has attended Gurukulam's online courses and studied with individual teachers learning music, Sanskrit, Vyakaranam, Ganitam, poetry, etc. and went straight to Stanford University. He was raised without a TV and got his first mobile phone in college. Wow! If this is not uh, unusual, I don't know what is it. That Welcome to P Guru's channel for the Thank first time. Thank you so time. much. It's great to be here. Um, so that I, I have a lot of questions to ask you. Since I have dabbled in blockchain myself, okay. I may be able to ask you a few questions on sure. that. Just to kind of put you at ease, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in the current blockchain startup. What does what area does it address? And okay. So on. Uh, yeah, sure. We'll get right into it. Uh, so uh, what we work, my company that I work for is called Eigenlayer, mm -hmm. and we're essentially we work in the Ethereum space, um, uh, sort of pioneering this concept called restaking which is sort of like so ethereum runs on this proof of stake model yes right? yes and so the problem is like there is there is this sort of decaying yield that validators get for you know staking in the network the 32 right. ETH or whatever it is um and so our uh, our whole goal is to sort of uh, find ways to sort of reuse this eth as like to build this marketplace for trust so the problem with blockchains a lot of the time is that they or blockchain applications, rather, yes, yes. is that there isn't there isn't any trust assumptions made at all, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of the, the one of the plus sides of blockchain as well. As it can be a downside as well. So how do you guarantee uh, that you know a system works the way it should? Um, is using economic incentives, and so our whole goal is to you know you know reutilize like stake that's locked up in in the Ethereum you know consensus layer, and uh, and and sort of reuse it to you know provide security and trust. For other applications, and you know, thus earning you know additional fees on top of the decaying yield that ETH validators already earn. Um, that's like sort of the, the wonderful, the wonderful, great, wonderful. Great idea, yeah. So um, one of the things that uh, will you know that will pique the curiosity of all our uh, viewers is you know you spent your childhood at home, yeah. home school. Yep. And who were your teachers, and yeah. how did it feel to be the one kid in the block which didn't, who didn't take the school bus to the school, yep. or come back? And uh, how did it, it's a little different experience? How did no, it definitely? Feel? I think I think so. The, the, we were homeschooled from very early on, um, and so initially, obviously, uh, as far as teaching goes and instruction, it's my mother, as well as you know individual tutors and things like that for subjects like English and history and art. In fact, we used to uh, go to this Christian co-op um, of like, so there were a lot of Christian families, larger Christian families in Pennsylvania who would, uh, who all got together uh, and some of the parents would teach. So we had an English teacher, Mr. Walter, who was wonderful. And so their whole approach in teaching English it was sort of like the so the classical method of teaching. So we go through, you know, all like you know whether it's like Shakespeare and like that sort of that sort of traditional approach to teaching in you know, English classics. And then we had art as well. So um, so those sort of things we sort of might be able to outsource and go to these like you know group settings and learn. Mm. Um, in terms of, I think obviously the main question that I al always get with this is, um, you know, how do you socialize, right? The the average kid goes to school, spends the whole day like ten hours a day with you know 
25 to 30 other kids at own age and that's like you know, you know that's socialization right when you're homeschool that isn't necessarily you know as doable right um, I think it's it's kind of a it's an interesting question right because we us personally when we were homeschooled we were able to sort of meet and engage in a lot of very diverse you know socialization settings um, you know for example like we, in fact, my mom used to threaten us, you know, if, if you misbehave, you're going to go, you're going to actually go to real school. <laughs> that was like a, a very valid threat that, you know, used to be the case. Um, but for example, we would spend a lot of our summers at uh, Puja Swami Dhan and Saraswati's ashram in Anekati as well as in Rishikesh. And you know, if, you, if, you, if you, as a kid, you know, you're a 12, 11, 13 year old kid, you just get to meet so many different people from all sorts of different backgrounds, whether it's, you know, it's an engineer from Bits Palani who's, you know, started a successful company and sold it, or, you know, somebody who's had like a heart, you know, life of hardship, you know, maybe struggled with addiction and is now recovering and they all sort of converge at this one place, right? And so you get to meet like all kinds of people from all sorts of places. In fact, at the Anikati Ashram, there used to be a, um, a Samavid Patashala as well. Um, and so we would, we would meet all these kids from various parts of North India, like my, our age, who have left their homes and have come all the way to South India to learn, uh, to learn Samavedam. And uh, so you get to meet people like that. And so for me, it's always almost like, you know, okay, now that, you, now that I'm going to college, right, people ask, oh, are you able to socialize? And are you able to like, you know, you know sort of socialize with your peers, your own age, and since you haven't had like 12 years of, you know, schooling. I, for me, it's honestly the opposite reaction. If you were to put any of those kids in the situations that I've been able to grow up in, like, would they be able to, you know, adjust and socialize? I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so having had all these sort of diverse experiences meeting people, you kind of, uh, it prepares you for the real, real world in all sorts of different ways. Um, so I never, never felt that lacking at all. Um, yeah. That's uh, very um, interesting in this, um, not US interesting, but real interesting because yep. sometimes we tend to use the word interesting in a different way in the United yeah. States. <laughs> it's a real interesting experience that you sure. get to so many, see so many people from different walks of life. Right. Because more or less uh, people who are growing up, whether it is India or US or anywhere in the world, right? Yep. There's a certain homogeneity about the group. Totally. Right? Totally. I mean, typically, if somebody says this is a school district, that is where, you know, Indian Americans, Indian British, British Indians, Indian Canadians, whoever, mm -hmm. good school district, good right. education, right? right? So then suddenly you see everybody has the same kind of a background. Yep. Each one's parent is, uh, you know, in high tech or <laughs> da, in, in a professional yeah. career like a doctor or something like that. So from that, you actually broken the mold, if you will. Totally because yeah. you kind of went and you saw the diaspora, the India, the diversity that is there, mm -hmm. the plurality that is there. Yeah. Now, what about friends? How, how did you okay. make friends? Uh, I think, so that's a great, great question. Um, of course, you know, we, we live, when we were living in India, you know, you're surrounded by a billion people. Yes. It's, it's impossible not to make friends at yes, our age. Yes. Uh, so that's one. I, I also spent a year, you know, in Gurukula Vasam before I went to Stanford. Uh, at this, at uh, in Chhattisgarh, yeah. uh, at this, uh, so this Pushpa Dikshit Mataji is her name, and she is a an incredible Sanskrit scholar, uh, specifically in Vyakaranam. Um, and so she has a she has a gurukulam. It's basically her house that she's opened up, and like dozens of kids sort of flow through there. Um, so I spent about uh, almost a year there, living in Chhattisgarh. Didn't know any Hindi or anything, so just <laughs> got dropped off. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> I need to figure this out. Um, so, but in that process, you know, you meet kids. Um, I had a, kid, a friend from Nepal, Kaushal, who, uh, uh, you know, they come from families where his father had passed away. And now his goal is to like learn Sanskritam and Jyotisha and then go back to Nepal and, you know, provide for his family, his two sisters and an aging mother. And so like, those are the kind of friends I've been able to make. Um, and so like like so yeah, it's not the it, not at all the homogeneity that you get from like going to public school or you know a school where everyone is the same background, sort of same level of income, same you know the same interests. They all want to go to college. They want to study engineering. It's like it's none of that at all. It's like it couldn't be more different. So I think I've been able to make friends. Um, Carnatic music is the other way. You know I perf I was performing quite seriously before I went to college. Um, and uh, you know, in that whole world, you meet you know accompanying artists. In fact, it's funny because like a lot of the times you don't know who your accompanying artists are. Yes. And so you just get thrown on stage, and they just show up, and then, you know, that's how you make friends, right? Like they just show up on stage, and now you have to do a two-hour concert with them. Uh, and so that, it's 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 not it's very unconventional in the way you meet people, but I think it just forms like much deeper relationships. 
because you just get to experience all these insane things together. See that I have so much to ask you. I love music. I'm a good music listener. Mm-hmm. I'm not a singer. I I like to like I like uh, music. I, and we can talk about Carnatic music sure. as we go through this conversation. Sure, sure. And uh, one of the things that you know, as a child, you probably see your neighbors scared. You know, where did you go? This oh, I went to Disneyland. This is like an annual pilgrimage yeah. that most children take, especially in the West Coast. If you are in the West Coast, you go to Disneyland. If you are in the East Coast, you go to the Disney World. I mean, Disney has it all well covered. Yeah. And, and the people in the middle, I don't know what they do, but typically they congregate either in the West Coast or on the East Coast. Yeah. So how did it feel when you don't go to Disneyland, yeah. your neighbor's kids go, and they regale you with stories about this and that? <laughs> did you feel like you were missing out on something? I mean, personally, no. Uh, I, I think it's it's also a very interesting thing, right? Oh, like, you had Jnana Drishti, you could see exactly <laughs> rocket rod all. going or something oh, like that. Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> I, I think it, it's very interesting because, so when we were kids, we would go to the temple, for instance, right? And and so we, we were lucky that we got the opportunity to, you know, learn suktams, like, you know, basic Rudram yes. Chama, Kampur Suktam, Taitri Upanishad, so, and, and, you know, know also, like, how to do a Pancho Pachara Puja or Shodasha Pachara Puja, for example, right? Very simple things. So when we would go to the temple, right, we'd be able to, like, if it's, like, you know, Rudra Ekadashi, something, we were able to be able to chant Rudram, participate in the yes. puja, you know, and the priest will see that, the Vadya will come and give you some tasks to do, right? So you just become like a part of that whole process. And the other kids are able to always just be running around because, you know, not being either bored right, and right. horsing around, you know, because they weren't able to participate in that, um, in that whole thing. And so if, if you have that enough context and you're able to like feel like a part of something, that be, that would be like an outing we'd look forward to. You know, you just go, you get to chant with them, you get rewarded by prasadam at the end of it. Like that's even see, even in Disneyland, right? If if I was a kid and I didn't know the Disney characters or didn't know the, it probably wouldn't be as enjoyable. So I think like uh, being able to have context and is enough, or being able to participate actively in something like we were in, you know, let's say te- in the temple. Uh, that that alone is like enough enjoyment as a kid. Like it's not anything complicated. It's it's just being able to get validated, be like, oh, I learned this, and I'm able to, you know, contribute to this thing. So yeah, I think I, th- I never felt that, I never felt like I was missing out in any way. Wonderful, you know? wonderful, wonderful. Now, see, um, the the reality strikes you when you've done 10, 12 years of studies. Sure. And, and then it is time to go to get some formal education. Sure. So most of the time, you know, you lived in US and in India. So yeah. there's a mix here. You lived in India, US and India. Yeah. So did you have to take the SAT to get into... Uh, I took the ACT, but yes. Oh, ACT. Standard, okay. So standard that is the other testing, alternative. Right? Yeah. So, so for preparing for ACT, again, they have all these courses, right? Yep, yep. What's that? World history, something, something, yeah, yeah, all yeah. sorts of stuff. Did all that stuff. Right? Yeah. And uh, so, how did you prepare for ACT? Personally, I think the ACT, uh, they just, you know, test books, I guess, right. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I they release test books, you do them. Um, but yeah, it's nothing, nothing like, just like the average kid would. Um, mm-hmm. It's not like necessarily schools teach for that stuff anyway, right? Um, maybe for like the advanced placement tests and stuff like that they do, like mm-hmm. AP Biology, AP Physics, right, calculus, right, right. which we were able to take online courses and, you know, mm-hmm. and do those tests. Somewhere I see that doing this Gurukulam style of studying mm-hmm. set a baseline for you, a fundamental for you that kind of helped you to absorb new things in a relatively quick amount of time. Okay, yeah. Would I be right in saying yeah, that? I think so. How did that happen? Okay. Um, I think, so it's it's not that, a lot of people will say, for example, that, you know, Samskritam is like very like closely linked to like how computer science, modern computer yes, science is, yes, for example, yes. right? Or Vyakaranam. And I think people don't necessarily understand why that is, right? It, it, and it's not just something people say. It's 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 that not that Sanskritam necessarily is directly linked to computer science in any specific way, right? It's that it gives you like the frameworks for being able to think about about problems in this in a very similar way. Um, and so uh, at this point, do yeah, we yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Slide, so yeah. viewers, uh, he's going to talk to us from his uh, screen here, but I will be putting this uh, on the on the video screen when we do that. Yeah, go ahead. Sounds go ahead. good. Yeah. So and I thought I'd like sort of explain. I've always this irked me when people would say this, but not necessarily know why they would say it, right? Yeah. So I, I was I thought I'd come up with like a very sort of brief example as to like how this is exactly the case, right? Because um, so, so I, I I studied I've studied Vyakaranam thoroughly, and also you know computer science is my day job, right? I'm I'm a programmer, um, 
And so I think this is a really basic example of how, how what the really the link is, right? Yeah. So uh, in in Parini's Ashtadhyayi, sort of the fundamental building blocks of the Ashtadhyayi, one of them is the Maheshwara Sutrani. So some people, you know, may have heard of them, Ayi Unrolak, Ayong, Ayoj, and so forth. It's basically like a reorganization of sort of the Sanskrit alphabet, right? And and there's a reason. It's it's a very like intentional reorganization of the alphabet. Um, so. The, the whole point is that you can, it's somewhat like a compression algorithm. There's, there's this thing called a pratyahara, which is sort of the compression algorithm that Panini uses to like, when he wants to like make a rule that affects a certain group of letters, and in a very concise way he needs to state this, right, in a sutra format. It's supposed to be as short as possible. So how do you do that? So let's say I have a some sandhi rule, which we'll look at, that applies to like the letters e, u, r, l, right? Now, instead of listing out those letters, he, he simply says ik. And ik, ik as, and if you know Maheshwara Sutrani, it says i, u, r, l, com, it combined forms like the pratyahara ik. So essentially I've compressed like four letters into like one syllable and I'm able to reference it like immediately, which is, like, which is honestly a crazy concept and something we do in computer science all the time, right? right, right. And so it's these sort of parallels so you start being able to think with, with this sort of drishti, right? It's, 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 it becomes extremely clear what the links are. Um, like Ach, for example, is a pratyahara that refers to all the vowels, a, a, e, e, like everything. Um, and, and, you know, yan refers to yavarala. So you, if you start, start studying grammar, you'll start to see these pratyaharas pop up. And you know, oh, okay, this, that means this sutra applies to all vowels or something like that, right? Um, and if you go to, um, oh, before I actually look to show you the exact example, a uh, quick aside on declensions, right? So in Sanskrit, we don't have prepositions like you do in English. So if I want to say like something is on the table, I use the word on, right? It's uh, not the table. The word table itself doesn't really change. Right. What if I have in Tamar, for example, if, if I want to say like Rama's name is this or Raman Udaya, I, I would add the Udaya part right, of the right. Raman, right? Right, right. Or, or like in the forest is Kartil, like, mm -hmm. you know, there is a line or whatever it is. So these are this, these this Tamil and Sanskrit are, are languages that get declined. So in, in the case of uh, Sanskrit, there are seven Vibhaktis, right? So Ramaha, Rama, Ramaha, Raman, Rama. Shabdamanjari. Shabdamanjari, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so in Panini, actually, uh, he uses these vibhaktis as like almost like data types, right? Mm. So anytime, like the whole point of Panini is essentially that I, I can take a bunch of building blocks uh, and put them together to form words with like very concise rules. Um, and so there's no like wishy-washiness about it. It's very precise, right? Um, and so if I have a, so there's a sandhi called yan sandhi, which is, and a sandhi is essentially like a conjunction of letters. So if I want to combine words together, the letters at the end and the start of the words have to conjoin to form one letter so they can put it all together. Right? Correct. Um, so in yan sandhi, there's a sutra iko yanachi. Um, and this is a me honestly a meaningless phrase unless you like sort of use right. the code of Pani, right? the meta language that he's created. Um, so ikaha, is like we saw is a pratyahara ik, right. but it's in shashti vibhakti. Uh, achi is again the pratyahara we saw, ach all the vowels, and then yan is again yavarala we saw is another pratyahara. Right. And in Panini, like these are basically almost like data types. So it, Panini says that anything in the sixth vibhakti in the sutra means that is the thing that is getting replaced. And then he says the seventh vibhakti means that the thing that is getting replaced has to be followed by whatever is in seventh vibhakti. And then Pratama, anything that's in Pratama Vibhakti in the Sutra is what is get is what is like is being replaced onto the thing that's supposed to get replaced, right? Um, and so if I have like ik, that means ik is in sixth vibhakti, it gets replaced by yan when it's followed by ach. Very simple. Like you got all this information from Iko Yanachi. It's it's insane, right? And so I can I can take an example like Madhu plus Arihi. U is a ik we know. Uh, arihi starts with a, which is an ach. And then, so I can apply the sutra, and I get madhvarihi. Uh, and so, like these are the sort of things. It's like a very programmatic. Like the, there's there's no like uh, ifs and buts about this. It's like a very once you know the sutra, that you know how, how to like form these sorts of words. Let me see. See, I'm I'm I mean I've studied Sanskritam, but yeah. I wrote the question paper in English, so mm -hmm. I can't say that I'm really good at it. But at the yeah. same time, I know a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. See here, what you're saying that Panini set it up in such a way that mm -hmm. if you take the alphabet set mm -hmm. that was used at his time, 596 BC, right. or something, like right. that, something like that, mm -hmm. and if that is the same set of letters we are still dealing with today, assume that, that we are, then all the rules that he formulated will still apply today. Yeah. We are talking 2,700, yeah. 2,600 yeah. years or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 
It's incredible. It's almost like in the in the you know in computer science you have this this whole concept of like Turing complete yes. programs and things like that, yeah. right? And th- that's really what it is. Like so, basically, Turing complete is that any computation that I want to do should be able to be done by this programming language. And if, yes. if so, it is Turing complete. Right? Yeah. Um, it's the same way. Like I, c- I should be able to take any combination of letters, any any sort of two combinations of words, uh, and be able to put them together, and there should be a rule for it. And so it, it's like sort of complete in that way, which is not the case for most grammars, right? To be codified in this like precise way just doesn't exist for any other grammar. And I think people don't like realize the magnitude of how hard that is to put together and how it's like you said, it's like persisted over like 2,500 yeah. years. Yes. And it's still applicable to Sanskrit as it stands today. And so it's, it's pretty insane. So um, there has been talk about uh, using Sanskrit as the language for going between two different languages. Take an example, mm-hmm. somebody who speaks only Chinese and somebody who only speaks Hindi. Mm-hmm. No, Hindi is not, tele, let us say Telugu. Okay. Uh, Telugu and Chinese. These two people want to do business. Mm-hmm. Now there's a phone in the middle and you're designing the phone's architecture. People mm-hmm. have said that you need to take the original language and store it in an intermediate language mm-hmm. and then from that intermediate language the rules are read applied to the destination language mm-hmm. and the reverse happens when the other person re- mm-hmm. so this intermediate thing people have always said that this is where sanskrit holds the best place mm-hmm. because it's got the shruti as well as the uh, grammar to com- accompany yeah. there is no two ways you can uh, mess it up right right Uh, what do you think? You are a programmer too in real life. Yep. Would you see this is still it's going on? There are people who say that on Skype you can have conversations. I mean, Microsoft has tried this thing with I think some school in Spain and one in Seattle. Oh, okay. The kids spoke English here. The, those kids spoke Spanish, mm-hmm. and and there was this in between. There's a Skype program that was doing real time translations for each other mm-hmm. back and forth. If you are the architect asked to design this, mm-hmm. would you choose Sanskrit and then? what would be the benefits oh it's an interesting question i think um well i, I don't i think modern translation programs are, are are mostly ai based at this point yes yes um and actually it's it's funny because uh, they're probably looking up tables and indexes or, or the, it's just like a probabilistic thing yeah, right? They, right they've trained it on a bunch of like data that that maps some amount of you know let's say one language to some one of the other language and probabilistically they'll be able to come up with like right, if right. given one input in one language the output is in another language um actually i uh, people always say that there's like this this thing between sanskrit and nlp and all that stuff i think actually sanskrit is a language it doesn't really need something like nlp right because in, in english because english for example there aren't many rules that like like you know sort of mandate the grammar of english yes, it's, it's yeah. very like that's why english is perfect for something like artificial intelligence which is all probability based right so like given one word i can predict with some certainty that this is the next word or this set of words is the next words and sort of it's all a distribution right but as in sanskrit like there are rules for how to put sentences together how yeah. to construct words and then construct sentences from those words in shastras like mimamsa and things like that it's like we it's all codified it's like complete opposite honestly right. like it, maybe if you were to train a model to um, to learn something like sanskrit it actually would be better because it would be able to pick up the patterns that are defined by these rules right versus something like english where it's all willy nilly the order of things can be any which way and that's exactly right. the sanskrit allows you yep to let's say there are three words in a sentence yep. each word is grammatically complete yep. in other words ramaha gruham gachami gachasi gachasi maybe i don't know gachati yeah gachasi gachati yeah. rama gruham gachati now you can turn it around and say gachati gruham ramam or any other way you want. and it makes complete sense it right? makes complete sense yep now it's not true with uh, rama is going home he's going, is home, going is home. Rama. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make yeah, sense yeah, because right? that's yeah that, that's the power of having like a well defined grammar and if you were to if you were to apply artificial intelligence to it in machine learning like it would be able to pick up those patterns right and it it would help it in fact because you know, if you give it some structure like that helps the machine learn much better um and yeah so yeah possibly uh, well uh, i growing up i used to listen to a german band called kraftwerk k r a f t w e r k okay Uh, they generated computer generated music okay. and it is like 1980s things <laughs> am model and is looking good and it is a metallic sound <laughs> yeah, yeah. and 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 they're making a computer sing it had its own interesting stuff and i used to wonder i i hope it doesn't turn out like this when you go from one language to sanskritam and back to the other language where you feel like you're listening to a news broadcast especially if you listen to hindi news news broadcast yeah. it's 80% sanskritam yeah Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same is 
Telugu, same is Punjabi, same is Bengali. So, but most of us don't listen to their Doordarshan Punjab, Doordarshan uh, uh, Andhra. Nobody does. We are all listening to the other one where it's 50% English. So there is this culti, this is corruption of yeah. language has taken place Absolutely. also. Anyway, that's a different rant for a different day. <laughs> now let, let's go back to um, get the, the important thing here is, and, uh, and you know Sanskrit inside out, you, you want to apply that. Uh, and you've said already that, you know, there are so many things that are fixed in Sanskrit that makes things easier. In other words, there is no... Um, uh, uh, there is no con controversy. The, the 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 meaning is very clear, yep. right? So, would you then think about just like C or Java having a Sanskritum based programming language? Because then you can precisely define what each word that you are saying yeah, sure. is intended to do, like a for loop or a go loop or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think it, it would probably be extremely useful to do that. But then you have to learn Sanskrit, though. <laughs> yeah, right. right. You have to change about Sanskrit. But I think. The, the bigger point or the bigger takeaway from learning Sanskrit as a language is more just learning, picking up on the, the frameworks that the, that the grammar specifically establishes, right? And like how that like can inform, uh, you know, system design and things like that uh, for other applications. It doesn't necessarily have to be in Sanskrit, but just borrow those ideas, right? Like for example, uh, um, uh, Dimitri Mendeleev who, uh, yeah. who uh, created the periodic, periodic table, table. Yep. yeah. So he uh, he um, according to like by the way there are 108 elements in the periodic table. Go ahead. Yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. But surprisingly, so at the time when Mendeley put the periodic table together, right? He his framework was so strong in terms of the periodicity and, and encoding that that at the time they didn't know half the half the elements that like yeah. would would currently fill up the periodic table didn't exist, right? But he had gaps specifically for them right. because because the framework was so robust and it turns out. He he was like he was very heavily inspired by the Ashtadhyayi from several friends of his who were Sanskrit scholars and things like that back in the day. Um, but like that's the sort of thing, right? So you have a framework that's so strong that even if there are gaps that currently exist in the future when new knowledge comes, it, it, it just it's able to sort of seamlessly fit into that framework. Just like you said, like 2,500 years, Panini's grammar has persisted, and it's able to do that because it's such a robust framework and it's so thorough. Um, and there's and the exception handling, like specifically, right? In Panini Sutras, when there's a general rule, it's it's a, they states a general rule followed by several exceptions, and actually, in a lot of cases, multitudes of exceptions, exactly like how we do in programming, right? Like a bunch of if-else statements, right? Um, and and so the the framework that way is like so thorough that you know it, even when new knowledge comes, it just sort of slots in perfectly. Um, and, and I think that's the takeaway from uh, from Sanskrit in terms of designing any system, right? Is is that like you want you want to design a system that's as robust as Sanskrit is as a language? Wonderful. Yeah. So, um, but you don't think that uh, the current hardware, like the Intel architecture or the ARM architecture, mm -hmm. you don't need to do any new architecture to support a Sanskrit compiler. No, I don't think so. Right? No, not yeah. at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a computer science graduate. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a more of a computer engineer. I, I look more at the interface of uh, how software meets hardware. That sure. interface is also pretty complicated. Yep. Yep. And that's where my work has been most of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have done a lot of talk about Sanskritam and computer science. Now we are going to go into a subject that I love, mm -hmm. which is music. <laughs> so, first question for you yep. is, um, I have not told you I'm going to ask these questions. Yeah. I'm going to ask you these questions and I have reasonably good uh, expectation that you will know the answers to these. Yeah. Have you heard of the Katapayadi Pravayoga? Yeah, yeah, of course. The Melakarta system. Yeah. Yes, the Melakarta system. So there are 72 ragas in which all the seven swaras, Sa, Ri, Ga, Ma, Pa, Dani are used. So these are called as Melakarta ragas. Yeah. Now in normal music today, not all the all these ragas are used in song because some don't really sound well because there is a thing about what your ear likes and, and so on and so forth. But Katapaydi figured out that I can make this thing so easy and scientific that uh, it will be it will be etched in stone just like Panini. So talk to us a little bit about how yeah. you came across Katapaydi Prayoga mm -hmm. and how it helps you to appreciate music. I'm not saying everybody has to go and learn yeah, this yeah. table. This is like a periodic table for uh, Sanskritam, for, for Carnatic music, but yeah, yeah. it just helps you to appreciate this music even better. Go ahead. No, no, I know. So, so basically the, the, the way the Katapayadi system is used is that, so Katapayadi is also just a way of encoding 
numbers into letters. Right? Yes. So basically, you take like all all the Sanskrit uh, Sanskrit letters, and each of them has like a corresponding number. So in, in the case of like for example, Kararapriya is a twenty second Melakarta, and the way you remember that is that the first two letters are Ka and Ra. So Ka, as ka it comes up when you put the Kararapriya table together. You'll see Ka is associated with two. Ra is associated with uh, two as well. So the twenty second Melakarta. In the case of Maya Malavagola, so you have Ma and Ya. And so ma is uh, five, ya is one. So then you have to actually flip it. So then my malagola is the fifteenth melakarta. So it's just it's just, it's just really know, cool. I have a question about this. Yeah. Somebody told me that it was not karaharapriya, it was harapriya. Uh -huh. But yeah. you, in order to fit it into this system, sure, sure. you yeah. put kara, and that I've, becomes. I've heard this too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Twenty-two. So just in order just to make this encoding like complete yes. for all seventy-two yes. combinations. Yes. Yeah. Again, another one is dhira shankara bharana. Dhira shankara Right. Shankara bharana is what we all know. Yeah. But if you want to fit it into this Katapayadi Prayavigam, you need to use... Deera or Deera. Hanumathodi. Yeah. Hanumathodi. Wow. Same thing. Yeah. You're on top of it, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is all my extent of, uh, extent of Katapayadi appreciation goes. So, now, I think this interview would not be complete without you singing us a oh, song. God. Now, there is okay, no this is Shruti definitely Petty. not planned. <laughs> <laughs> this is, there is no Shruti Petty here. There is, oh, there you is, can do the phone though. Oh, you can use you, the, you phone. Can do yeah, the phone. Absolutely. You can, you can use any tool here that is available for you. <laughs> and we would like you to... Uh, you can have... Take whatever time you want. And, oh, sure, and sure. I mean, just cut back and then paste. Go ahead. Uh, so. it, it's Kartika Deepam, so we can uh, yes. we probably do something, you know, on Muruga. Yes, uh, yes. Let's see. <clears throat> <laughs> Sharavana Baba Yenum Tirimal Dindram Tani Sada Jabin Nave Om Sharavana Baba Yenum Tirimal Dindram Tani Sada Jabin Nave Om Sharavana Baba Yenum Tirimal Dram Tane Sada Jabir Nave Om Sharavana Bavayanu Tirumal Dram Tane Sada Jabir Nave Puram Yerita Parama Neti Kalilu Dita Puram Yerita Neti Galiludi Tapuram Yerita Parama Neti Galiludi Tapuram Yerita Parama Neti Galiludi the Boda Swarupal for Bada the Ne Panil the Boda Swarupal for Bada the Ne Panil the Swarupal for Badam Dane Panil de Sharavana Bhavayanu Tirumal Diram Dane Sada Jabir Nave Manmi Sekid and Dural Piravi Pinia Tirkum Manmi Sekid and Dural Piravi Biniya Tirku Maya Yagala Peril Baneriya Jegu Maya Yagala Peril Baneriya Jegu Talmarini Garkuli Karunai Nila Vemirum Talmarini Garkuli Karunai Nila Vemirum Shalmuga Priya Shada Shada Pavana Talmadi Nigar Kura Karuna Nila Vimirum Shalmuga Priya Shada Shada Pavana Sharavana Bhavayanu Tirumal Dijam Tane Sada Jabil Nave Bhavayanum Tirumal Dijam Tane Sada Jabir Nave Wow, Sabash.
amazing, yeah. amazing. So I was going to ask you whether it was uh, based in Sharmuga Priya, but then the song itself says <laughs> that it is. It's yeah. superb because Sharmuga Priya is uh, a ragam that uh, Subramanya likes lots. You've done a lot of stuff on Vyakaranam, uh, Siddharth. Now we also talked when we were introducing you that uh, you've done a fair amount of work in Ganitam, which is mathematics, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now uh, along this, you know, path of learning at home, what did you do in this Ganita Shastra? Was it like back from Panini days or was it, there are so many other people, right? Bhaskara, yeah. for example, and so on and so mm, forth. Yeah, yeah. But talk to us a little bit about sure. Ganita Shastra. I think, I mean, apart from Vyakaranam, I, I think uh, I've been able to sort of, Vyakaranam has always been my main focus, but I've been able to dabble. But that's a basic b- building it's block. It's a basic building block of yeah. everything, right? From that, you know, you can study, you know, Ganitam is one, mm. um, you know, Kavya is another one, just if you want to go and, in fact, on, on my, the first things I ever posted on my blog or website was like, just like looking at Kirata Arjuniyam verses and sort of breaking them down and that mm. sort of thing. Um, so like, I, I, I do, I do love to like, you know, read Pro, uh, you know, poetry and 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 sort of Vyakarnam making sets you up really, really well for that. Right. It, it it's also it's also interesting like Vyakarnam even by just even if you just study Vyakarnam right you can learn so much about just our culture or what you know life was like back back in Panini's yes, day. Yes. Like there's this there's a sutra um, uh, Nipata Eka Janam. Okay. It just it just informs like uh, you know something to do with this Pratyakaram. Okay. Um, but in 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 describing that Panini gives an example. Um, like so, normally, if you've ever noticed, like when we have guests in India, we, we always walk them at least to the gate, or or you know to their vehicle or whatever it is. We never just you know say bye at the door, sort of shut it, that sort of thing, right? And you always wonder, oh, that's such an interesting and very nice trait about you know Indian hospitality, right? So Parini says that uh, in in describing the pratyahang, he's like um, uh, he gives this example, a udakantat atithi manugachet. So basically saying that you need to fall udakantat means until the water. So essentially, back in those days, you know, yeah. there would be a stream or a right, river. Right. So, you know, for the atithi, you know, someone who doesn't, like, unannounced guests, not atithi, atithi, like, you would basically walk them to the stream or the nearest stream or the nearest river and then, like, sort of let them, yes, let them, let yes, them off. Yes. So you just learn, like, interesting things like that. Right. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's it, that's what makes it so much fun, right? Yeah. Beyond just... I don't know. I, I don't have words to say what to uh, describe you, uh, Siddharth. I'm telling you on your face because <laughs> it, it's this is not Mukhasthuti or anything like that. Yeah. You are like you know, yeah. way younger and much more. Um, you've got your, uh, I should say what, basic building blocks, right? Mm, and hopefully, there's yeah. nothing you can't achieve. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I, I wish you all the best. And uh, this this is just the beginning in your life and um, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that you're going to go far. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you so much for having me.